All right, we're recording. So whenever you want to go, Adam, we're ready. Ready. Five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the sixth edition of the IAOA's new version of CollabCast, a podcast about insurance, insurance agency owners, by insurance agency owners, and for insurance agency owners. As always, I'm Adam Serwinski, joined by the flat-brimmed philanthropist, Nick Ayers. Uh, <laughs> By the way, before we go on any further, let's just take a moment really quickly to highlight all of our members and thank them so much for the support that they gave to our fellow agents down in the hurricane-stricken parts of the country. We know it's not it's far from over, but it's important really to acknowledge all of you that gave, and thank you so much. It really does mean a lot to all of us that you're all here to support us uh, and to support one another. But now on to the task at hand. For the first-time joiners, I want to let you know that this is your podcast. We want you to steer the conversation, ask questions, be involved. And to do this, we need you to engage in the chat room because you're going to be muted. Uh, so you, what you'll see in the bottom of your screen is a bottom that is just simply labeled chat. That will open up a box that will allow you to type in questions, uh, comments, or just simply interact with Claudia, Nick, and I. Now, please feel free to use it throughout the podcast, although we will ignore questions uh, or statements of, please let me speak, because uh, Nick just likes all the, t the attention anyway. <laughs> so... Tonight's pod collab cast, we have the distinct pleasure to learn from one of the few people who has sold craftsman tools and a builder's risk policy. <laughs> Claudia McLean runs one of the most successful agents, insurance agencies in the Northwest and does so by super gluing her clients to her agency, whether they want to be or not. <laughs> Odds are if Claudia has written someone's insurance, she will continue to write their insurance, their sisters, their cousins, their friends, their uncles, their neighbors, and even their dogs. So Nick... <laughs> Yes. Let's find out how Claudia was able to ensure generations of rain-soaked rain Seahawks and Mariner fans uh, on today's collab cast. <laughs> Let's do it. I, I would imagine being a Seahawks uh, and a Mariners fan, it's got to be it's got to have its ups and downs for sure. Absolutely, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this year, in particular, my their defense is just killing me on fantasy. Just. <laughs> One of the things we want to make aware to everybody who's watching is you're going to, the benefit of having this live is that, and you joining us, is that you can ask questions. Uh, there's a chat feature down below. If you simply click chat, Claudia's going to say some, she's going to give some pearls of wisdom, some, some gold bricks. It is your job to take notes, to think of questions relative to the content that she's sharing and ask her. You have her full attention. Uh, ask her the question and, uh, and get an answer. So, um, Claudia, I want you to tell me a little bit right out the gate. I want you to tell me a little bit about how you got into the insurance uh, agency business. And then if you could just kind of give us a small breakdown of current staff and kind of location, just give us the who, where, what, where. I think I said where twice. Give us, give us, give us all, that, all that good stuff. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I got into the agency business after having been in retail, um, was in a, um, retail management for Sears. And, uh, and Adam's right. I taught people how to cross-sell um, Sears detergent when they were taking an order for tough skin jeans on the catalog phone lines. And so that was uh, my, my start in learning how to cross-sell and, and round out accounts, I guess. Um, Love brought me to the Pacific Northwest. I'd grown up in Southern California and uh, didn't know a lot about, of ins about insurance, had been life licensed briefly um, in Southern California before moving up, uh, but found a great company that had a farm team program. It's a regional carrier nobody's heard of called PEMCO, but um, it, uh, it gave me the chance to kind of learn from the ground up uh, uh, about property and casualty and uh, start a scratch agency. Uh, from day one, and uh, uh, 40 years later, we just in June celebrated our 40th anniversary of the agency, and 40 years later, uh, we have about $7.5 million of premium volume. We've got, um, it's all 100% personal lines by choice. Uh, we um, have, uh, our optimum staffing would be a total of eight people which would be, uh, and I say optimum because we're shorthanded right now and, and definitely send me, anybody who's moving to the Northwest, <laughs> Mark can't have them. <laughs> but um, no, we, uh, um, we, optimum staffing would be five customer facing agents that both sell and service. Uh, along with our part-time um, marketing director, uh, who is also a licensed agent and is filling in for us right now, but for the most part, she does marketing. Um, and then we have an administrative person. Uh, we have a college um, student, graduate student, that works about 12 hours a week, and myself. 
you mentioned something in, in that uh, in that you by choice only focus on personal lines. Can you explain that that thought process and Looking back, I mean, you've been in the business for 40 years. I would imagine that for the bulk of that time, that's been the thought process. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, are you happy with that decision? Do you think that, uh, if you had to do things over again, that that is still the same decision that you would make today? That's a really good question. I ask that almost every day. So, <laughs> uh, honestly, um, when I started out, I was trying to be all things to all people. And so I was balancing writing. I, you know, I, I was working after I'd left PEMCO's confines of um, their home office and was uh, working uh, you know, in my own agency. Um, I was writing everything. I tried to, one of my early commercial accounts was a car dealer. That was crazy. I didn't know anything about writing car dealers. And Todd, um, Shepard, and Todd Shepard hadn't yet hit the scene yet, right? Yeah, he hadn't. And if I'd known him, I would have sent it to him. But no, um, so what I realized back in those days when it was just really me, I mean, for a long time, it was me and maybe a part-time person. And, you know, we kind of grew very organically and gradually. What I realized is that um, at least at that moment in time, commercial lines clients expected to be catered to and called on in person. And personal lines clients expected you to be in their off in the office to answer their call about whether they had towing coverage or not, you know. And and uh, the two really um, worked opposite, you know. They, they they conflicted with each other. You couldn't be good at both. And also working on some of the more unique commercial lines accounts that just happened to you know drop on my lap uh, was very time consuming and time consuming and took me away from the bread and butter of promptly and quickly writing the the personal lines and so at at um, some point I just decided you know um, I'm going to sell off the commercial book that I had built and just focus on personal lines and look for ways within our office operation to streamline um, all operations as as smoothly as possible um, using technology very early on we were paperless completely in 1998 wow. uh, before any of the agency management systems had um, paperless you know scanning or anything like that we used a, a system called Docstar back then but um, we found we had to find ways to just be efficient with you know the one or two people that I had at that time and um, so um, looking back, you know, looking now, Nick, the question is, you know, what's the, the crystal ball going to be for the next decade or two? And uh, will, um, you know, will the personal lines arena um, change dramatically either because of, um, you know, the uh, captive uh, or direct um, book of, books of business growing or will it change because of, you um, uh, self-driving cars and what the whole you know ramifications of that will be i you know i look at personal lines and i don't think touch the surface yet really in fact if anything i think that um clients are finding more new and creative ways of using their um their cars their properties um their um their brains and in, in terms of getting into side gigs and and uh creating um home-based businesses to the point where I think we still have opportunity in personal lines. And I, I think as these things become more complex, the clients need us more than they ever, they ever did. Um, that being said, you know, I may look back and say, gee, I sure wish I had um, listened to Todd Shepard and <laughs> learned the car business better. Nah. Uh, we remain open and ready to make the change if, if we need to. And that's one of the beauties of this business. We could pivot. We could pivot and, and focus more on life. Or we could pivot and, you know, heck, with my age, we could pivot on long-term care, you know, or, or Medicare supplements, although it's not where my passion is right now. But, but that's the beauty of our business. If one line goes away, we, we go and, and find another um, hole to drill. So you talked a little bit about the kind of the growth your business has kind of taken from starting, kind of taking everything and then streamlining. Uh, we obviously wanted to talk to you about one of the things was retention tonight was one of the things we wanted to highlight. So how is retention built into that kind of growth line? Um, as well, you build your business. I, I think that that for us retention has been you know the magic bullet to organic we've never bought an agency um, all of our growth has been organic and it's been um, you know one client one family at a time and so uh, we realized you know fairly early on that um, protecting that back door keeping customers happy was really important but it really wasn't until about 2006 or 7 that we um, we really started tracking the metrics on it 
And um, it was very rudimentary at the time, um, but you know, just keeping track of how many um, um, policies in force we had, how many clients we had, what the average number of policies per client, and every month consistently looking at that and talking about it and seeing how we can move that needle ever so slightly. Uh, and sometimes it really is a very small, uh, slow incremental move. Um, I think that that has been huge uh, because the team has embraced it and it's become it's become the way we do business and looking for um, you know I, th I think for us it's been deciding that retention is so important that we'll forego some other things like we might forego um, high premium high risk policies because we know in the long run you know for our agency it doesn't fit the profile of what stays on the books. And we're, we're seeking clients that are gonna stay on the books 10, 15, 20 years. And, um, and so that starts with, you know, where, where are you fishing? You know, where are you getting your prospects? And then once you get the prospects, how are you quoting with retention in mind? So, um, you know, for us, what, we don't write the minimum limits. We always um, really emphasize the EFT and the paid in full. Um, the annual policies, we start cross-selling from the start and we have a compensation plan that incentivizes, you know, the, the type of business that we want to write. So you, when you uh, think, oh, sorry, Nick, go ahead. You, you, sorry, uh, you can totally tell this is unrehearsed. So uh, <laughs> you had mentioned something and I kind of want to touch, I want to kind of delve a little bit deeper on this. You, sure. you talk about two things. You talk about your staff mm -hmm. and because retention is such a big priority in your agency, Right. Can you talk about some of the different traits that you look for in your staff and, and how you bring that on the high end process? The other thing I want you to touch on, if you could, is just a follow up and, and to remind everybody, there is a chat feature here. If you have questions, like I'm thinking, I'm thinking of these questions. Uh, we don't have these written down. I'm thinking of these questions because I want to know. I want to take my own notes and watch this again. But so utilize that chat feature to ask questions. But my second part is uh, you talk about where you find these prospects. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there are times you just don't, you don't have a clue or an idea. You have an assumption based on how a client might behave, but you're looking for clients for 10, 20, 30 years. Where are you finding these clients? And what does, what does your client that's going to stay for 20 years, what do they look like now? How do you find those people? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about team first? Or do you yeah, want to let's talk about okay. the team first. <laughs> talk about team first. I think that's everybody's challenge. Um, because we have the unique model where we don't have producers and we don't have CSRs, uh, and I'm not saying that that's right for everybody at all. That a lot of people have been hugely successful in segmenting those, those tasks. But because of that, we are looking for um, a profile of a person that can be empathetic but de and detail-oriented, but also um, not be so shy as to be uncomfortable in, in, in suggest, you know, making the suggestive um, uh, cross-sell as an example, or, you know, working with somebody and asking for the referral. And so um, we do, our, our hiring takes some time. And, and over, over the years, I found that if I hire, um, and, and I use all sorts of different uh, personality profiles to, you know, to try to find the right fit and gauge the profiles off of the people that in our office have been successful with this model. Um, but one of the things that I've found is that um, with our model, if we have somebody that's too much of a, a salesperson, um, then uh, they, the service ends up being dropped or not handled correctly. And because of that, then we have customer dissatisfaction, and, um, and the whole team concept that we work so hard at building, you know, within our, our, our group of, of agents falls apart. So re recently, the part of the reason that we're, we're short staffed is that one of our team members who we hired from uh, a sales organization from AAA, um, he, you know, we went through a lot of conversations and he was right on the, the border of whether he, he tested for our profile or not. And he was close enough. We went with it um, because he is a referral. But, you know, at the end of the day, he made the decision for a number of reasons that uh, he and his wife were going to 
move out of state and um, start another uh, career. But it, it really boiled down even before that, we were kind of noticing that um, he was having frustration. He thought he should be selling more. We weren't putting the pressure on the sales. We we're putting on the pressure on developing that, that relationship with the client. But, you know, nine years of sales, 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 sales from his prior employer had, I think, um, perhaps set the, the, the profile in his mind that wasn't fitting with ours. So for us, it, 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 it is a challenge, but when we find the right people, they actually blossom in that environment. And um, they're, they're, in, they're paid a very, you know, um, I think generous base salary, but then they have the ability to almost double that with the incentives that they develop over time, you know, through cross-selling, uh, selling referrals, and all of the various behaviors that we want. Um, so uh, it is, uh, it's a challenge, but for us, that's the way it's worked best. Just to follow up on Nick's earlier question, though, yeah. can we talk about a little bit more about how you prospect with your retention in mind? So where are you setting your lures to okay. catch people who you'll be able to retain? So, um, so when you're talking prospecting, obviously, you know, referrals are the, the number one source of new business for most agencies. Uh, in our case, the combination of referrals and cross sales account for about 70% of our new business uh, every year. Um, and um, the ref how, how we incentivize the referrals are talking about it constantly. We have regular communication programs with clients and we can get into that a little bit if you'd like because I really do think that a lot of retention success um, uh, comes from staying in front of the client and providing value to the client however you define that it with your your demographic and your, your uh, um, uh, group of, of, of clients but for us um, it's a combination of and uh, hard copy news cards, just little postcard type things. It's uh, uh, that go out every month. It's uh, email uh, communications. It's um, uh, unusual offerings. Like I think I posted on on uh, on our uh, group that when our uh, uh, the cell phone rules changed in our state. We went and we bought uh, cell phone holders for everybody and, um, and offered them in a special email. And, and oh my gosh, we've gone through about a thousand of the cell phone holders. Um, just surprising clients with things that are unique, being involved in their community and letting them participate along with you, um, I think have all been the things that have attracted the type of clients that, that stay with us and aren't as likely to leave for a couple of dollars. And, um, you know, and then even with lead sources, I was looking at, uh, before the call, I was looking at what we're paying um, in within our marketing dollars. Our marketing budget last year, when I added up everything, was about $92,000. Now that's with a large agency, but we spend a lot of money on marketing. And of our um, of the marketing uh, dollar, eighty seven percent went to um, only two categories, and one is um, educating or nurturing our clients, and the other is taking care of our community. And um, I just I believe so strongly that that's where you know I get the the, the uh, passion to continue on is when the agency grows um, the the things that we can do within our community grows and I think that the clients that come to us because they've seen us in the community um, doing doing things side by side with them they're the clients that stick all right so let's brag a little bit what kind of community stuff are you doing or are you driving that you feel have the biggest impact I mean what do you what are the things are you doing that's kind of leading people to walk in your door Okay, so um, we have a, a regular calendar of different events, and I know some of the people on, on IAO I have heard about things like Stuff the Bus, which is a school supply drive where we collected, along with some other businesses, 1,700 filled backpacks over, you know, before the, the school year started. We've done our November drive collecting um, um, socks for the homeless. We've done uh, working women's wardrobe drives uh, in concert with the YWCA um, so that that, um, that uh, women that are going back into the workforce can have uh, quality clothing. Um, then we do some things that are just specific to benefit our clients, like the defensive driving classes for our um, senior drivers. They get a discount on their auto insurance, and we keep them a little bit um, safer in the process that we sponsor and pay for, and they just need to show up and 
and we get them the discount. So, you know, there are others. I think also partnering. Uh, we do an outdoor movie series in the in the summer in partnership with the um, the city parks, and um, it attracts a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to bring their family of of six or eight um, to the movies to see a, a, a you know a good family style movie. And so I think that um, what we're just always looking for is that little bit different. Um, activity that we can do that can surprise and delight people and even when and that's where the newsletter comes into play a little bit or email however you want to do it every agent i know is doing wonderful things in their community um every agent i know has you know a huge heart and is giving back much more than i am um but what i think uh distinguishes or has and and it you know, I think some agents will say, eh, I don't want to be patting myself on the back by telling, telling people that we're doing this or that. I think we need to be the models in our community. We need to be the ones who are out there that are um, sharing, whether it's through the newsletter or uh, email or whatever, what we're doing so that other people within our community will say, you know, gee, you know, McLean is doing that. We can do that, too. Or um, the friends of each of our staff um, will decide to join us at, at an event. We, you know, fun runs that benefit cancer charities and things like that. All of those can be fun, but they can also, um, they can also do good. And I think that that's, um, that's just been a, 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 I think in the last 10 years, something that has really grown and I'm looking forward to, you know, what we're going to be able to do even in the future. So I think there's nobody on this call and nobody's going to watch this who's, who, I've never met anybody who, who has said a negative thing about you, uh, right? No, nobody has bad things to say about somebody. Oh, they don't know me. <laughs> but, but, so I want to ask, so I wanna ask you this question. With that in mind, I want to ask you this question. Um, I, I think I know the answer, but I, I almost want to, I just want to hear you talk about this because I think that there are people who are on this call and who will watch this recording who, when you start talking about some of the different things and activities that you are doing in your community, uh-huh. I think the first thing that some people might say to themselves is those aren't the kind of customers I want. Why, why would I do something that helps uh, people who are who, homeless people? Right. Yeah. I, I, mm-hmm. and, and why would I do stuff for people who don't have maybe the income to even be my client yeah. uh, for that 10, 20, 30 year clip? Yeah. So can you talk about the mentality of why you do those types of community events that maybe you're not even getting, you're not, and maybe you are, but you're not getting direct customers no, from right. that from that pool of people that you're you're serving. So so why do those types of events? If you could just kind of touch on that for yeah. just a moment. Yeah, well, I, I think for a couple of reasons. You know, part of it is all of you know. We really try to keep our focus on youth. So whether it's um, you know doing something that has to do with the the schools, even the the sock drive, the focus is on the the women and children socks, um, but. You know, if we don't take care of youth in our community at all economic levels and help them to raise up, then, you know, where's our future customer going to be? Um, so I think, it, you know, while we're doing it to, to be mindful that, that we are blessed and we need to share those blessings, I think there's also a business purpose in it, and that is that we have to raise our community up. We have to be there. If we're not there, who... Who's doing it? Right. It's a completely different approach. I think a lot of people get into the trap of they, they, and I I could say that we're guilty of this. We put on our own, we put on specific events trying to capture a certain crowd that's going to come to that event. Whereas your approach is completely different, right? I mean, it's, it's not different, but it's just, you're not looking to make today that person who you're giving socks to. No. That their customer. You're just doing it because it's the right thing to do for your community. But when our clients, the thing is, when our clients and our prospects hear the things that we're doing, mm-hmm. they, they're either looking at it and saying, oh, gee, my, my passion is this. Will you help with that? And right. we, we try never to say no. You know, we have the, the charities that are our big ones, but we try never to say no if somebody comes to us with a special request. But the other thing is that um, they're recognizing the, the kind of client that we want in the agency is the kind of client that's doing that as well mm-hmm. in their own life, in their own way. Yeah, that's a great Whether point. Whether it's taking, taking in, you know, a relative that doesn't have a place to live. I mean, it doesn't have to be 
big picture, you know, donating a million dollars to the hospital. It just has to be people that are like-minded yeah. and understand that there's value. And I think those are the people that are going to say, you know, if McLean Insurance goes away, that's one less person out there helping our community. Let's let's put our money locally as opposed to over a 1-800 number. Yeah. And Mark, I mean, Mark Atkinson, and I agree with you 100%. Mark Atkinson hits, hits the nail on the head in the chat. He says, Claudia is a giver at heart because true giving doesn't expect a return. And that's, that's just, that's the epitome of selflessness. Uh, great, great point, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, cheers, cheers to you on that. Speaking of the chat though, Nick, we do have a question from Sean when he asks about, uh, given the kind of layout you talked about with not having CSRs, yeah. how do you segment then the service load? Is it done alphabetically based on the accounts they write and their relationship? Or is it some other way like a random assignment? So how do you handle the service load? And then following up with how do you pay renewal commissions to those employees um, given this, you know, kind of following up to this, how this answer is going to go. Sure. Is it based on who serviced last or who, who actually um, was the relationship originated with? Okay, so again, I'm just going to be the outlier on this whole thing. I don't pay renewal commissions. And again, personal lines, I don't think you have to pay renewal commissions uh, unless you have a producer model that needs it to support it, right? Um, but the, the book of business is owned by the agency. And when the agency grows, everyone benefits. And so my feeling is that we are not large enough to, to segment by either who produced the book of business, because what happens when the person leaves, you know, how do you redistribute it? I mean, you can, but, um, or by alphabet, because quite frankly, the customer will, has the right to choose who they want to do business with. And we have the responsibility to take care of people as quickly as possible and, and most efficiently as possible. So how it works in our office, and again, just, I can't say it were, would be this way for every agency, but for our office, everybody is charged with handling whatever comes in the door that day, sales or service or both. And it's usually both. And so if a call comes in, we do have, you know, like a, a, a round robin type thing where, you know, Monday morning, Nick may be up first and Laura may be up second to take the call or the walk in, but that breaks down really fast as people get on the phones and, you know, so it's the next person up. But basically when the client calls in, if they ask for Nick and Nick's available, then great, Nick takes the call. If Nick is with another client, which he may be, then the response is that, um, you know, Nick is with a client right now, uh, but we have several other agents available. Would you like to speak to Laura? And nine times out of 10, the client will say, sure, all I wanna do is get an ID card or make a change of car or whatever. Laura takes the call, gets it done, it documents Hawksoft, which is our agency management system, and the client is happy, they're on their way, they're not waiting for a phone call or a telephone tag or anything along those lines. If the client really wants to talk with Nick, then um, the client can go to Nick's voicemail and Nick will call him back. Um, so that's, that's how we distribute the workload. Uh, we have um, an inbox um, that is the team at autohomeboat.com inbox. And so all of the leads that come in, and um, my gosh, thanks to Chris Langell. I, if anybody hasn't seen it yet, we've kind of done a soft launch. We've got a new website, autohomeboat.com, that Chris designed. And uh, all of a sudden, we're getting overwhelmed right at the time. We don't have the people to cover it, but <laughs> um, with, with leads. Um, and, uh, and, and so those leads come into the team at autohomeboat.com. Uh, we use a simple Outlook color coding, and uh, people go through and, and claim the lead. They're expected to get that into Hawksoft immediately and uh, to work it immediately. Don't claim it unless you can, you can call the person right away. And it tends to even out. It tends, um, the, the person that wants more business, mm -hmm. right, more new business, you know, they're going to be fast on the trigger to, to claim it. But right now, they, the, the team for years, in fact, the team has pretty much just worked as a team. And, you know, there's going to be a day that um, we're probably going to have somebody who's selfish. But right now, everybody works collaboratively because they know that, you know, um, if, they're, if they're too um, greedy today, then tomorrow somebody, they really wanted to write, you know, somebody's going to be greedy and steal it from them. And we just don't want any of that. So you just really take an all hands on deck perspective. Whoever's Absolutely. there, pick it up and go. Absolutely. And our incentive programs, you know, people wonder about the renewal commissions and rest. Well, our incentive programs um, protect the back door. We have a team bonus 
as well as individual bonuses. And the team bonus rewards growth and PIF every month. And the whole idea behind that is that everybody from the marketing director to the receptionist mm-hmm. to every agent has a responsibility to make sure that the customer experience is so good that people don't leave. Gotcha. Uh, Claudia, it's, it, if someone's listening to this, they're thinking, man, it sounds like she really has all of her ducks in a row. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, right. It's, it sounds like, you know what you're doing. You've done it. You've been doing, you've been doing this process for a while. I'm kind of curious if you can kind of take me back a little bit and kind of talk about what that aha moment was for you that said, you know what, I'm doing it this way. I need to, I need to change some things. Yeah. What, what was that moment and what caused you to kind of start this process? Because your process, we talk to people all the time and your process is a little different. Yeah. Uh, how did you come up with it? And what was that moment that said, you know, that made you say, I need to change some things and, and how I, how I function? Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 um, I think the numbers actually did it. Um, it started with, um, with Quantum Club having a, um, well, what did he call it? Uh, the Easy Millions Calculator, but anybody can see the same type of calculator if you have Safeco, because Safeco has a, a calculator that just basically says, what, what does it mean to, to, to an agency if they bump retention by one, two percent over a period of time? And the numbers are staggering, you know, close to a million dollars on an average agency, you just bump retention a couple percentage points. So then looking at, well, what can we do that will improve retention. And I'll tell you, you know, we don't hit it all the time. In fact, I, just before the call, I, you know, I was mentioning to you guys that, um, you know, our goal agency wide is to look at retention or to have the goal of retention between 94 and 96%. 94 and 96. 94 to 96 is the range. And it's been the range for the last eight years. This year, we're, we've dropped below it. We're at 93 point whatever. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little disconcerting to see it drop a whole point because I know how many, you know, tens of thousands of dollars we're leaving on the table. I think that the current um, marketplace with the number of uh, rate increases that we're seeing um, is, is having an effect. I think the general malaise in the country uh, where everybody's angry, uh, you know, we have a lot of people that are, you know, just frustrated. Sure. That can be, but, but the flip side of that is that's also creating some opportunity for us if we have the bandwidth. Um, that's why I want another agent real fast. But if we have bandwidth, because the people are, you know, have the same frustration and anger with their state farm agents and they're all mm-hmm. state agents and we just need to be there providing the solution um, and, you know, kind of get them into our web. So. So you talked a little bit, uh, and I want to take this to be a little granular about how you look to hire, you look for the empathetic mm-hmm somewhat outgoing, maybe not too salesy though. Mm-hmm. Um, but specifically you talked about using profiles and mm-hmm. just to get on a granular level, what, how many profiles do you use? What right. types of profiles are you losing to evaluate this so that you can hire for this kind of overarching goal of keeping business that walks through your door with you? So I start with Omnia and Omnia has actually, I'm, I've just learned and it's, it, it, we're, I'll let you know how it works out, um, that Omnia has a relationship with indeed.com um, that has allowed me to, to put the, uh, the post on Indeed with no additional char- cost uh, from the Omnia. And the prospect can actually uh, follow the link and um, complete the first of the behavior profiles with Omnia. Um, I don't have to pay for it unless it's scored, but they can do that all in kind of one shot, which is something that is interesting to me and, and um, we'll see how it works out. Um, so I, that is a profile that I use, Adam. Um, another profile within Omnia that I use is one that, um, I'm trying to think of what the name of it is, but it, it, it basically is, um, it measures intellectual intensity. So, you know, we, we have a complex business. It's, you need somebody who is willing to think a little bit deeply about contracts and how, how uh, things work and listen for the red flags. So um, there, and we also need people who are quick to learn technology and um, that, uh, that particular profile will um, assess that. We've also used a DISC profile. I know Mike Stromso um, has a relationship with a, a, a person that is a counselor on the DISC uh, methodology, and we've used that. And we, both with Omnia and with DISC, we profiled our, our current team, the team that was working, um, and then asked 
uh, in particular, Omnia to benchmark against the team members that were the most successful in our model. Um, so that we're not just using a straight um, defined CSR, or defined producer profile. We've got our own custom profile based on the successful members of our own team. Claudia, tell me a little bit about, uh, if you can, do you have any indication as to the average age of your client? I should know that. <laughs> um, I, I can get that for you. I the, uh, I'm just kind of curious because yeah. what I, my follow-up question to that is, yeah. is, let's say I, Nicholas Ayers, I'm 34 years old. I, I have a, I, I'm a homeowner. I have multiple vehicles. Uh, I need life insurance, umbrella, all that. I'm mm -hmm. a good, I like to think I'm a good customer. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about, I become a customer at your agency. Right. I, I sign on the dotted line. I give you my money. You give me my proof of insurance card. We're off to the races. Right. Can you tell me what I should expect from your office in that 12 months with the kind of touches that right. I'll, I'll be seeing, kind mm -hmm. of uh, the communication that I'll be getting? Tell me about your process there, specifically in the first 12 months and, okay. and, really, and really how you get me to stay on the books. Okay. Okay. So onboarding process, basically. And, 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 um, you know, I, I, you really pose a good question about the average age. I can't tell you that, but I will look it up. I can tell you that we have been very deliberate in our hiring model to the degree that we can and to the degree the candidates are available to have, um, a team member that represents every decade of, um, of age. So a 20 something, a 30 something, a 40 something, a you know, 50 something, because I really do believe that if all I did was hire agents that look like me and were my age, then you know, the agency is gonna die off in a couple of years sure. or you know, a decade, whatever. You know, so I think it's really important because people do buy from people that are like them. And so we need, that's why we need to have, um, you know. Kind of a, a, kind of a diverse. Uh, a diverse you know, uh, population of agents. Um, in terms of the onboarding, so once uh, a client has uh, completed um, the application over the phone uh, or possibly with email uh, with, with one of our agents, um, everything is handled with DocuSign. Um, I, the one thing, you know, we have a lot of to-dos that um, wonderful IAOA members, you know, have proposed. And one of the things we haven't adopted yet, but we need to, is getting the reviews, um, th that review link connected to um, the, the DocuSign uh, sure. final documents because we could do a better job getting Google reviews, but um, we're, we do that. The agent sends uh, a thank you note handwritten uh, to the client. Um, the same day? Same day or the next at the latest. I mean, if it's five o'clock, it's the next day. Um, as the agency owner, we have a, we have a, uh, you've probably seen it, the vinyl folders that are McLean Insurance and yep. we have, um, we have our most recent newsletter in there. We have a client service report card. So we're surveying them on their experience. We have a giveaway, something, you know, that m might be flat enough to put in, uh, but brand it to the agency. The other side, we have a couple of pages with a lot of photos of the team talking about our referral program, talking about who do you contact those type of things. Um, that goes in, in a large bubble packed envelope, very distinctive looking bright blue, um, that um, has a, a, a welcome letter with my handwritten note welcoming them to the agency and let, letting them know we're looking forward to working with them. Um, then fast forward a few days later, there's an email uh, sequence that starts. And um, every um, six weeks or so in the first three months, you will have um, an email talking about one or one thing or another about the agency. Um, and, um, it, and then, and of course, they're kind of um, immediately enrolling in getting our hard copy newsletter and our any other email. So they're getting that along the way. If they have a claim, they're going to get a handwritten note and a follow up uh, claim service report card. If um, they refer somebody to us, they're going to get a handwritten note and and a, a gift and and um, the the recognition of you know a, a charity donation going out. Um, but so all together in that first year, not counting the normal touches that they would get, which is probably in the neighborhood of about sixteen, if you count the emails and the um, the hard copy newsletters, um, they're getting another uh, eight contacts. Okay. So I went to public school. So 16 plus eight, that means uh, 24, 24 uh, touches in the first year. So almost on average to a month. That's how many, that's how often you're staying in touch with. But, but it's different media 
And, yeah. You know, yeah. I think that that's really important. Things need to look different. The person that uh, would walk my, um, my newsletter directly to the recycle bin is not the same person that might junk the email. Maybe they are, but you know, it, you have to be sending the message a couple of times with several different media uh, for them to get it. So you send the copy, and this is a question that was just posed. Yeah. Sean had the same yeah. same inkling as I did. Uh, you you send the copy by physical hard copy, and you do the email. Right, but it's it, not. Right? They're different messages. So this this is the this is the hard copy news news card. Okay, goes like this. Um, this is a picture of Mary. We're talking about uh, preparedness this month. So she was sh sharing her go bag and her husband is an attorney who, who has gotten into this thing. So the whole story of how you build your go bag. And then on the back, we've got, uh, you know, some information about rewards the team got. We have a recruiting message here because we're recruiting for new people. And mm. some of the places that you'll see the agency, the upcoming events in the next months and then our printer prints the address here and sends them out so these go these go out like i say once a month um and then the emails i'm not a fan this is just my preference sure my fan of a long email with a, the, a that has lots of stuff in it i'm just not going to read it I'll, amen sister so the emails are very subject specific so when the cell phone thing changed. Um, the email was about the, the, the change in the law and, you know, how do you get your, your cell phone holder? Um, we're going to, right now we're in the middle of trying to win the um, Reader's Choice Award for our, our area. And um, so we're going to piggyback that with a recruiting message and send that out. Um, if we had a storm, we have a, you know, we would have storm messaging going out. So um, but just it's kind of topical, a just, to yeah, yeah, topical kind of yeah. quick, uh, hitting. So right. do you, do you carry that same amount of touches and energy into years two, three, four, and five of, of a, is it perpetual that you're touching your clients that many times a year? Yeah. Well, it would be with the exception of that, that extra, you know, say eight that are more in the welcome sequence, okay. but the, the seasoned clients are going to be getting the, the 12 monthly news cards plus, you know, the six or so, so email messages. So just on top of that, then, you know, that, that kind of plays into, you know, that's how I deal with your agency. That's the communication I'm getting with your agency in year yes. four, or I'm sorry, month four. Yeah. Tell me about when your renewal process starts, how right. far out, and do you, uh, tell me where you fall on this philosophy of requoting every client at renewal. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't have the bandwidth to do it. Uh, do you have a threshold then that says if, if the premium is XYZ um, over? We never, ever, ever start with requoting. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the things that, um, that I'm trying as much as possible to do, and that's where our college, um, she, she just graduated from college, she's a grad student, is going to come into play uh, because our agents are so overwhelmed right now. So I'm looking at what, what can I do? send down a, a level in terms of expertise. So she's going to start the calls. The calls um, in my perfect world right now, they go out as soon as the, the renewal hits Hawksoft. But in my perfect world, we're going to try to back it up a little bit further. I loved the renewal process that you talked about at the last conference. I, if I could implement that, I thought that was just awesome. Um, I'll but, treat I'll treat you your retention for uh, no for no process. I love it I love your uh, and you and can have the renewal process brilliant. I'll take the retention <laughs> but um but uh so so the call is it doesn't really mention the renewal the call is hi this is Rosie Claudia asked me to give you a call um, we were just looking over your file recently and we wanted to say thank you so much for your 13 years as a client of McLean insurance uh, we really appreciate it that means a lot to us uh, by the way if you've had any life changes any you know people uh, leaving your house or um, or any uh, improvements that have been made to your house you know this would be a good time to give us a call and let us know and here's a phone number or email and that's the you know, thanks again so much and she'll be doing those and the the reality is that most of those are going to go to voicemail and my challenge and Nick I and Adam I really want to draw you out of this because this is one of the stumbling blocks it's a conversation point I think for everybody is that we've always been doing these by um, by by phone to give the personal touch to get the voice you know in there and the rest what my younger employees have told me is that many of their friends, when you're calling their cell phone, um, they see a phone number that's not in their um, directory, and um, they don't 
They don't answer. even bother to listen to the voicemail, right? It's yeah. just like, you know. It's a, it's a nuisance. Yeah, exactly. And that's the last thing we want to be with these calls, right? So we've got the whole spectrum. I've got 90 year olds and I've got, you know, 20 year olds. And so trying to find the best fit. And, you know, part of that is going to involve us having to survey people as their, you know, as to their preferred method of contact. But I think it's become more and more difficult to have a single process um, in this. But to go to the point of the renewal, you know, to answer your question about so, okay, even if she makes that call, Mr. Jones calls and, um, you know, he wants to know why his rate went up $100 or $1,000, whatever. Um, the agents start by talking about discounts. They start by saying, so glad you called. Let us take a look at your policy. Let's see what's going on. Let's, you know, let's have a conversation about um, where, we can, where we can help with the rate, if, if rate is the concern, right? Um, and um, one of the things that I've done is I wrote a blog about the, the rate increases that have been hitting the industry. And the agents are really quick to send a link out uh, to the customer with that blog explanation because that mm -hmm. is just like kind of further reaffirmation. It's not just Caitlin telling them that, yeah, rates are going up right now and that's the way it is. But they're hearing from me who, you know, hopefully they've heard other things that are credible from. So if they get to the point, the customer says, hey, if, you know, I, I know you have other companies, you know, I want you to quote, then they will. But um, part of the issue for us is that all of the companies have on the, on the books more rate increases to come. Nobody's saying we're done with the rate increases. So hmm. for us to pick up and move somebody from Safeco to Travelers or from Travelers to Progressive, um, we're not doing them any favors if at the next renewal, um, you know, they're just in a different part of that cycle and uh, the new company point. has taken the rate increase. And worse than that, <laughs> we have educated them that every year they need to shop their insurance. And when, they, when you educate people that, you will never break that habit. They're going to call you every year and say, hey, you know, who's doing the best now? Because they think that's how they're, they don't know how to shop for insurance. Right. They don't know that there's benefits to, you know, earning claim-free discounts or considerations from company underwriters or whatever. We have to be the ones that, that have that conversation with them. So our agents are, um, and some are more, <laughs> some of the agents are more adept than others to deliver that message of, you know, let's, let's have a conversation. This difference now is down to, we've saved you some money. This difference is down to a couple hundred dollars, but let's talk about the benefit of, of hanging in there. Unless we know, you know, it's just company A has gotten egregious and yeah. you know, then obviously we're going to talk about our, the benefit of moving, but there was a reason that we placed you with this company. If the reason hasn't changed, if there's not some, you know, family dynamic that has changed, then, you know, let's hang in there. Let's see what happens next year. If you still want us to change next year, we can. That's a fantastic, uh, that's a fantastic little point right there. That's a nugget. If there was a reason we put you here. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that, that's a fantastic sure. point. I mean, that's something that I'm going to, I'm going to take back immediately to myself because that's the trap that we've, we've fallen into. And I think it's easy to fall into that trap of, you know, it's time for renewal. And in California, you know, oh, if, yeah. if, if you've only taken a 10% rate increase, you know, we're cheering with you. We're thinking that's, that's right. fantastic, you know, and so we're, we're having to churn the same, or our oh. staff and our service team and our sales team, they're churning the same. They're getting business. burned out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that's a fantastic point you make. The other time thing I tell people is that, um, you know, we, you know, those of us who've been in the business for a while have thought in terms of the X date, you know, whatever the renewal date is, that's where the customer's trigger is going to be to either leave or stay. That's not the case at all. It's every month. You know, most of our clients, at least for us, we get them on EFT and the retention on EFT is dramatically better than retention on any other payment plan. So if you can get them on EFT, do it. But um, all it takes is this is the month that I was just told that Susie needs braces or my overtime was cut or, um, you know, my daughter's getting married. And now the sudden you or, or, oh, and, and I think this, this is the tsunami that's going to be facing anybody that has clients that are age 63 and up. Um, the tsunami that's going to hit are retirees that realize I didn't save enough. 
And all of a sudden, the cost of the Medicare supplement is much more than what my employer-based health insurance was, or whatever the, the, the situation is, what I expected in retirement to be, it's not, and I don't have, and I'm afraid, especially in those first 20 years or so of retirement, I'm afraid I'm going to outlive my, my money. And so they'll start going through their, um, and they have the time, they'll start going through their, um, their uh, budget with a fine tooth comb, and they could call you out of the middle of nowhere. Their policy just renewed with a decrease two months ago, and they're, they're talking to AARP. So I think we have to be conscious. That's why it's really just doing something at renewal doesn't really help. It has to be that continual relationship and that continual conversation. So I have a quick comment for you, actually, in the kind of giving better together uh, environment we like to have. Shelly, actually, from the chat had thrown out that maybe part of your onboarding would be to put, their, put the office's number in their cell phone. And then that way they would it. pick up that call. So yeah. I thought that was a really cool idea of where you kind of just bolster each other, make that part of the onboard, and now you have that, and you could even move it into text or whatever it might be, and it's coming up with your name on it. That, um, that's brilliant. Or even just sending it out. A te- and one thing I've done with prospecting, and this could be like a, an onboarding thing, is, is create my own, and I took this from Aaron Nutting, but I create my own contact, and then I text it to my clients, or I text mm-hmm. it to a referral source, mm-hmm. so they just save that, that contact. And people are like, why would you have your own contact in your phone? Well, not for me, for people to give to others. And it's almost yeah. like an electronic business card. Yeah, I love it. So that idea. might be a, a way of going That's about doing it. Way. But a follow-up question, and maybe to play devil's advocate, yeah. with 24 touches, two a month, yeah. I can't imagine you don't get some level of pushback being like, okay, enough's enough. Claudia, we love you, but I don't need to hear from up from you. Is that something that happens? Like, as For me, as an agent owner, that's my yeah. concern. I don't want to wear this person out. So they're yeah. sick of me. just want to move on to somebody else. Yeah. Um, she's thinking of a nice way to say no. Yeah, yeah. right. No, it's a fair question. You just know that I'm just going to start I'll, calling them every week and see what I can do. I'll get. tell you, I had, I've had two requests to uh, discontinue the, the hard copy of the newsletter. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't many more that are just going into recycle, but two requests. But, One but how long have you been doing it? Uh, since 2006. Uh, in wow. different iterations, but the wow. current iteration, probably the last seven years. Do you, do you send them to people who are no longer with the agency at all? Do you, do you keep those people on the list? Um, you know, it becomes an expense factor. I like to keep the, um, the lost souls, which is what we call the people who have left us in our <laughs> email sequences. But um, not, I love not the, the, not the mail. newsletter is too expensive to gotcha. keep them. I'd like to, but I can't. I yeah. also prospects in really good, solid prospects in the mailing list. Every okay. Okay. But, um, but yeah, Adam, I've had two people. One was the secretary of a doctor who was getting the mail of his adult, of his older father. And she got tired of sorting through the mail, you know, at our newsletter. So she was insistent we take them off. And, you know, up here in the, you know, you know, the, the very ecology friendly area of the Northwest, there are some people that uh, would prefer not to get paper, but only one person actually asked. Um, so yeah, um, I think what happens, um, Adam, is that it's um, because you do mix it up, it, it, it doesn't feel like we're hitting them as, as frequently as, as maybe we are. And again, I don't think everybody sees everything. You know, it, what is the delivery rate? You know, a successful email delivery is maybe 35% if you're lucky of an open rate. So, you know. You, well, let's be honest. Like how many times do they hear a State Farm commercial a day, right? How many yeah. times do they hear from other captive agencies and otherwise? So 16 is probably light for them. But I was just curious. Just no, other good, the, good very question. valid question. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you have an, uh, an idea of the the person the, who who has the the longest who's been with your agency the longest do you do you have do you know that who that person is uh yes i do okay and do you have an idea well, how many years has have they been with you is it you? 39 years is, is, this person is excluding yourself right it's not yeah it's not yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 30, it, it, 39 years that's since the very beginning yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because back on the farm team uh, program, if we, again, cross-selling, you know, I'm, I'm just a strong advocate, pay 100% commission for sure on, on cross-selling if you need to, because it, it, it retains the business. But um, back then, that's what happened. If we cross-sold in this particular program that was in at PEMCO, we cross-sold the account, that became our account. And uh, so, um, yeah, the, the longest tenured client was one that I wrote the cross sell to when I was down at PEMCO. Now, do you do anything special 
as far as tell me a little bit about client appreciation if you do yeah. anything like for your clients that have been with you for and and do you do you do you stage it do you say okay this is for people who have been because i think like uh i think of like joe jimenez i yeah. saw or even mike strom so you know yeah. they, they took some of their team that have been with them for like 20 years or some of their clients and they went yeah. to a casino or something yeah. like that yeah you know do you do anything special and do you tear it and how do you how do you talk to us about your client appreciation and how that works well mark atkinson is the person to talk to on client appreciation because he does it so well um i i wish we did more um i do we do segment our clients basically uh, right now based on a number of policies in the agency. So we've got a silver, gold, platinum type segmentation. And I'm guessing that guy who's been with you 39 years isn't monoline. He's not monoline, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, and, and so we have done some things like at Thanksgiving that were only for um, that particular, you know, the gold and the platinum clients yeah. as an example, just as a vegetary yeah. uh, consideration. Um, but part of the challenge is that some of my gold and platinum may have a family member that is silver and it's not because That's they're bad people. It's just because it's, you know, they're adult parent that doesn't drive anymore or, or you know who knows so i've been a little reluctant to do too much in that regard what i really want to do and hawksoft is really close but not perfect yet is i really want to have the ability to be able to actually say this is your 32nd anniversary with our agency awesome. and i can do it for anything that has happened since we converted to hawksoft in 2003 so i can go back that far but I, but the real long tenured ones, I can't without, we actually even hired somebody over the summer once to try to build um, the, the database that would tell us, you know, what the actual anniversary date was and it, it didn't end up being accurate. So <laughs> Rolex, Rolex is for everybody after the 20 Yeah, but I, I do, I do think for agents that are starting today, I mean, this would be the takeaway. If I were starting today, boy, I would have a, a, a data point that was searchable in your agency management system that has the, the, the date first started. And I would um, every year on that anniversary or in the month of that anniversary, I'd be sending out a, a, an anniversary. I think anniversary cards with the agency are more, more pertinent and less superficial than birthday cards. Sure. You know, that's just my bias, but because, you know, birthday cards, you can, I, I think it's, it, it takes more work. It to stand, and it stands out. It stands out yeah. a little more. Yeah, I mean, exactly. people get birthday cards for their birthday. They don't get yeah. a, you've been with our agency. You've been a, a family member for 25 years. Yeah. That only happens once. Yeah. You know, another, another thing that um, I, I haven't done as well as I wish I could. And, you know, your presentation, Nick, really gave me the inspiration to try to get that uh, onboarded soon. Um, is um, I think that when you ask survey clients in a period of time, about six weeks to two months prior to their um, renewal, and the survey has nothing to do with the coverage. It just is a survey that says, how are we doing? Are we meeting your expectations, right? Do you like us still? Do you like us still? Circle yeah. the box, you know. Exactly. Something very simple and easy. You no. send that out. If somebody says, yeah, if they've responded positively, right, what are the chances when they get that renewal mm -hmm. that they're going to leave? Right. Um, you know, the, the uh, Robert Chaldini's book, Influence, says they've done – college studies on this. If somebody has raised their hand and said, you know, I'll do this little thing, say something nice about your agency, it's much easier to get them to do the big thing, which might be to pay a renewal that's an increase. And so, um, I re and, and the, the side note is, is if they don't say that you're wonderful, it gives you a chance to repair the damage before Right. Uh, the renewal actually hits. Yep. So uh, it's one of those things that are on my to-do list and I hope somebody gets it done before me. <laughs> uh, but, and you know, no, truly, I, I, I just, I really believe that that could be a game changer for some of us. Now I want to just jump in really quickly because I really want to highlight the chat guys. If you're on the, if you're on with, with us and you have ideas or thoughts or things you want to bounce off of Claudia, please feel free to jump in the chat. But Shelly popped in with another question specifically dealing with the number of touches you have and with specifically mm -hmm. on regards to emails Mm -hmm. Do you ever have problems getting with your system if too many of your emails get tagged as spam or immediately deleted or filtered out? Yeah, it's, it's, it, I've tried multiple different email um, services. You know, we've used Constant Contact. We've used Agency Revolution. We've, you know, it, it's going to happen. 
And yep. um, I think that I, I, I'd love to hear if anybody has a good solution for it. Wish it wasn't, but. Um, Claudia, how much time do you personally spend with clients? Um, n very little, none. Okay. So um, that, my, that was... my office is the first office that they encounter when they walk in the door. Mm -hmm. So they know I'm here when I'm here <laughs> and I try to be, you know, except when I'm traveling for business. And, um, and when they come in, I always, either when they come in or when they leave, I always try to pop out and say hi and thank them for being clients of the agency. And that's particularly the case whenever we're doing any campaigns where people are coming in to, you know, pick up giveaways or to donate. I'm always, I always make flag exchange day. I'm always here um, to, to, to be present there. But when it comes to actually, you know, making that car change or anything right. like that, um, I, it was a hard decision for me to make a few years back, but I had to take that step back. I, you know, I built the agency doing all that stuff and doing it better than everybody else in the agency. It and, was in your blood. Yeah. But I realized that I wasn't doing the right thing for my team. Um, you know, things, important things like getting payroll out. Uh, <laughs> that never, you know, was the exact issue, but I mean, I wasn't doing the things that I needed to do for the team to lead them. If I was also trying to take care of, you know, Mr. Jones's claim. So right. it's been really hard, but I, I have taken the step back. People it's, know I'm here, but I'm not doing the work. And so I think it's, it, it really speaks to, and that was kind of my assumption was that very little to none was going to be yeah. the answer. So that really speaks to the cohesiveness and really your your leadership style that you're able to have a staff that when the name on the door says McLean and they're not speaking to Mr. or Mrs. McLean, they're speaking with Nick or with mm -hmm. anybody else in your office, that they're able to maintain this kind of cohesiveness and this environment where people still want to do business with your agency um, when they're not dealing with you specifically. And you had to make, how long ago did you make that call? Um, you know, I probably started stepping away about, I want to say about six years ago. Okay. And I finally got to the point where I just, and it had to do with, you know, did we have enough coverage in the office that I could do that without leaving people, people hanging? Yeah. I probably stepped away fully, uh, you know, over a period of a year and a half after that. So four and a half to five years. Wow. So I, I'm out, I'm out, I want to jump on that humble brag. You know, you were doing it better than most of your other your teammates, right? You were doing it in the office on yourself, right? <laughs> it, that was my ego. That, you know, at the time, I had to be the awesome. best salesperson, you know? You've got to be it, right? You walk yeah. in that room and you own it. And, and that's how you built your business. And the question, yeah. I guess the follow-up I have is, how did you build your process to basically replace you, right? Because if you were the best, if you were the one who did it better than everyone else, yeah. when you brought, built this plot process for retention or even just the process from all these touches that we've talked about tonight, right. how did you take your factor into account for that build out? Yeah. So I think you first have to identify one or maybe two people on your team that you could um, feel comfortable handing your very best friend over to and know that nothing's going to fall between the cracks. And if you haven't found that person yet, then you've got to find that person first. And, um, and so I was lucky enough, Nick has been with us now. And by the way, he's going to be here, uh, uh, be in uh, Phoenix. Yeah, um, awesome. So Nick has been with us uh, now in December, it'll be 17 years. And he will have ownership of the agency by the end of the year, part, you know, a small percentage so that he is um, uh, an owner of the agency. Uh, and, uh, you know, he started as a receptionist. It was only going to work one semester and then go back to college. So it's possible to grow. Um, somebody into he's a far better uh, agent than I ever was I mean he just has this natural thing instinct of how to work with clients so um, I was lucky enough to have Nick and then later Laura and Caitlin joined the team and so if somebody came in today I would actually tell the client you know any one of these three people would be by far and away your better choice to you know I'll, I'm here if you know if there's any questions after you've talked with them you're welcome to you know, come and chat with me but I have a feeling that they can process yeah. this more quickly and more efficiently and you know with the professionalism that you would expect from us yeah from I think I, I think that's the struggle that I at least have now is I want to get to that place where you're at mm -hmm. uh, where I struggle, and I think a lot of agents with, with staff probably struggle in this area to some degree, is 
having that trust, you may have a fantastic staff, but you have these relationships and, and you yeah. more so because you've been doing it way longer, yeah. but you have these relationships with people and just handing them over to somebody else where you're not able to control every aspect of that relationship from your end is tough. It's, it's tough. tough. And you have to have an agent that's willing to uh, keep the lines of communication open so that if you have handed over, you know, the VIP client to that agent, that they're willing to keep you posted so that the next time you run into your good friend, Margaret, you know, at a foundation board meeting that you know what's going on in her life because they've trusted to report back to you what's going on. And not just clients, but you know, for me, my struggle is referral sources. I mean, you deal with the referral source that's been dealing with you for a number of years and yeah. now you're handing that off to somebody else and i think you you hit it you 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 phrased it so well uh you know your time is 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 very valuable in the agency as the agency owner going to that person and saying you know what uh adam can do this this is what adam does every second of the day yeah. he can he can do this better than i ever could you're better off with adam i'm here but adam is really he's got a phd in this and i you know i'm just I, right. just, I just make sure the lights are kept on yeah. uh, and we have internet service. Yeah. That's what Adam does. Right. So yeah. I think how you spin that to your, how you spin that to your clients, your referral sources, um, it just, it, it makes all the difference, makes yeah, all the difference right. in the world. So, yeah. but I wanted, I do want to circle back because yeah. one of the things you're talking about there is talent, right? It's really talent driven, yeah. finding that person to rely on. Yeah. But I think some of it probably has to be processed too. Right. And we've talked about it with the touches. So what does what if any process things that you were, were your kind of what you did and how you just built your agency, did you impart that on your process as an agency as a whole? Was it that take everyone take it as it come kind of attitude or was it, you know, something like that that became part of the process, not just we got really lucky with who we hired and we kept them around. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm, I guess I'm not sure I'm following the question. Sure. So like, Unfortunately, some of us are not always to have the, uh, able to have the best talent, right? Well, and so that's everybody, it, right? Yeah. So the, the tact. So, but when when I had asked you the question about how you kind of recreated yourself and maintained yeah. your level of service and care and retention, yeah. you talked about the people, and that's certainly yeah. essential. Yeah. But did you do anything, or did you part anything on the process that you tell them to hold or to maintain? Well, that yeah. So. So there are there are processes, written processes, um, that we are hopefully continuing update. We've moved over to a SharePoint platform, and the processes are being built again because they, they get out of date over time. But for somebody new to the organization, we realize that we're not um, we're not doing any favors, you know, in terms of um, setting expectations unless they've got something to fall back on. I can't remember who whose uh, webinar I was on, but it was it was brilliant. Um, the, the comment that was made, I, I learned from everybody else and, you know, we just try to implement it, but was um, you, you have to have the process written out to the degree that if, um, if Mary comes in the office to work on Saturday and she needs to get a binder out, that she can go to that process designer to that, we, we call it the McLean roadmap, but she can go to a document that's in SharePoint and she can pull it up and she can go step by step and know exactly what she's going to do and not have to worry about asking anybody. Your newest person should be able to have the, the roadmap to guide them. And, you know, that's, again, that's a work in progress. We don't have every process um, written out the way it should be, but that's our goal. And we're moving, you know, toward that. And, and then um, I think the other thing that's important is to set service standards to say, um, and this is especially important with things like Dave Ramsey leads or uh, any of the internet leads that we get that come in is, um, you know, it's really critical to um, at least make that first contact with the person uh, within minutes if possible. Um, that's your best chance of, of closing the sale. You may not close it right at that moment, but the fact that you made contact with them within minutes is, is you know, impressive. Um, our challenge with that is just the 24 seven clock. You know, and we, we haven't quite, you know, I don't want people having to think about picking up a call at 10 o'clock at night because somebody, you know, wants a quote at 10 o'clock at night. Some, some agencies can operate that way, but we're not big enough to be able to, to do that. But to the degree possible within business hours, and a lot of times when I'm at home, when you ask, do I do any of the work? <laughs> when I'm at home and I'm seeing something coming in, I'll just send the email out saying, hey, thanks so very much for contacting our agency and I will have somebody give you a call on Monday. So 
Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Dave Jackson from Jackson Insurance in sunny Gilbert, Arizona, uh, has a question. Uh, he wants to know, Claudia, do you regret naming your agency with your last name? Good question. That's coming from yeah. Dave from Jackson Insurance. From Jackson way. Insurance. Yes, Dave. Yeah. Because in fairness, when Nick takes over the agency, is he going to want to run an agency that is McLean Insurance or... Should it be something else? I don't know. I mean, it, it was what people did 40 years ago. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Good, good question. Um, I'm not sure what I would change it to now. I mean, the only other thing that's memorable about our agency that, you know, but I don't think that goes into a good name is, um, you know, our URL. Autohomeboat. Autohomeboat.com. Yeah. Yeah. And it would also put it to the top of the alphabet. But, Dave, do you uh, regret naming your agency yeah. after yourself? Yeah. He says yes. Yeah. How long ago did you have to, did you get autohomeboat.com? Oh my goodness, I don't even remember. I mean, back when things were first starting out, I didn't use it right away. In fact, some of my old emails are, I had the URL, but I didn't have it coordinated with the registry and I needed to get an email address set up. And so some of the old emails were like Mick MC because of McLean, Mick, mickagent.org. <laughs> I still have that email. I, you know, just, I don't, I don't use it, but, um, but yeah, uh, it's been a long time. I couldn't even tell you. I was just curious about that. But so do you have, when you, when you look at this kind of what you've built and, and kind of, you know, and starting as an agent who's just kind of starting off, what, what would you tell agent at five years, agent at 10 years, agent at 15 years? And would that be different uh, as in the growth chart? Like looking back, if it, it, what would you tell, Young Claudia. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I, Let's go back in the way. I'm going to, I'm going to play like according, like heart. Right. Music. Yeah. I wanted to do a light question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wise what? enough to give that advice. I mean, I have so much, you know, one of the things I love about IAOA is that um, I am inspired every day by the younger agents in our group, the ones that are scratching to, to, to get the clients in the door to pay the bills, to afford their first hire. I remember those days. Um, and I, it's harder today than it was then. There are more buying options for clients uh, today that um, don't necessarily require going to an independent agent. So I'm not sure I'm wise enough. Um, I, I really am trying to learn from the younger agents some of the, um, the ways that we can continue to be relevant uh, to the you know, emerging client bases. Um, I think that probably more than anything else, I've wasted far more money than I can ever imagine on advertising gimmicks, on people coming in the door. I don't care if it was in the old days of the yellow page guys or the, the grocery store, grocery cart, you know, naming or, you know, you name it. Um, there, there, people are better salespeople than I am. <laughs> and they'll come in the door and they'll say, oh, this is, you know, this is the best thing since. And um, the number of times that I've made mistakes, um, you know, investing money that could have been, again, going back to the two major places we invest, our clients, their education and their safety, and our community. If I had, just, mm. if I had known enough back then to invest in those two areas and, and trust, trust the process that it will, in, in the end, um, you know, de deliver what we want. Um, I, I think I'd be happier because even if I wasn't any larger as a result of that, um, there would have been uh, families that would have benefited from the education and there are, there would have been, you know, people in our community that would have had a little bit more financial assist. So What's your most regrettable uh, gimmick that you paid for? Oh, no, I mean, you, you oh. brought that up. I want to know. Like, were you out spinning signs? Were you? Uh, did you? You know? Uh, oh my goodness! This. What was the worst? Oh, you've got me. I, you know, without a doubt, uh, the years of Yellow Page. You know, before I gave it up, probably. But everybody would probably say that. Um, and oh, you know, advertising on the uh, the sports calendars. I'm probably going to make some people mad. You know, when the sports teams, the high school sports teams come and sell you the little business card yeah. thing on, on their, their calendars. Um, yeah. You know, who's paying attention to that? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I want to address something and we're going to wrap it up here because I know yeah. we've taken way too much of your time. I, I oh, and it's not my time, but everybody else's. <laughs> uh, but we're going to wrap this up unless we get a couple, you know, last minute questions, but I know you're really involved um, 
with a couple of different outside organizations that yeah. are that are complementary to our industry. Things like ACT uh, mm -hmm. and, and other things. You, you spend a fair amount of time, I think, kind of going places on national councils and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But what do you see as somebody who uh, has been in this industry for 40 years, has seen a lot of change? Mm -hmm. Where do you see the independent channel in the next few years? With, in regards to technology uh, as opposed to just behavior? What, what, what do you see as, on, as in, that, in that very near horizon of our industry? I think, um, I think our distribution channel is, um, has both opportunity and threat. I think if we keep doing things the way we've been doing it, you know, and I don't mean the members of IAOA because in general these- We're talking the industry in general. Exactly. If we're talking the entire industry in general, people have to either step up their game or get out of the business. You know, there is no place for an, a, a carrier to have to worry about whether an agency has an agency management system, has paper files. Carriers, um, they are not, you know, they really are looking at our channel. And if the first thing that they see is that, or if carriers, the first thing that happens when the rep walks in the door is the agent is, you know, arrogant and rude to them, you know, they don't, they'll find a way to not use us. They'll find a way not to need us. Um, I think that we need, but they, I think the opportunity is the carriers are, there are some carriers, awesome carriers that are really trying to lift us up to help us to have the tools to find the way to connect with that consumer that they know wants to work with an independent agent. And so I think that what we, the best thing we can be doing is encouraging each other to step up our game. You know, I have a friend who has an agency, still doesn't have an agency management system. I'm constantly bringing that question up to him because at some point that agency, if he has to sell suddenly, that agency is not going to have any value without having the proper automation. And so either we have to step it up and, and meet the requirements of the next, you know, how would all state, uh, you know, one of the things I, I think of is our brand is each of us. Our, the independent agency brand is each and every one of us. And if somebody walks in the door of an old school agency with old tired furniture and tired people sitting at the desk who are frustrated and not happy. That's what the consumer's experience is about our distribution channel. And it hurts every single one of us. So I think that, um, you know, we need to step it up from the standpoint of staying positive with our carriers, telling them, yes, we can do this. Give us the tools, but yes, we can move forward and, and continue to, you know, hold on to and hopefully grow market share. And I think if we do that, then our, our channel will succeed and prosper. But um, if we don't, I, you know, I, I think the handwriting is on the wall that companies will find other ways to, to spend those dollars. Hmm. That's awesome. Well, one last question before we close uh, comes from Mark Atkinson. He wants to know what your take is on the Seattle Seahawks this year. <laughs> Oh dear, my take is I am not encouraged with what we've seen. You know, <laughs> one win, two losses so far, not so good. It's a long season. It's a long season. It's a long season. I, I'm supposed to have faith, just like Mark has faith in his San Francisco Giants. <laughs> do I drop the defense? You need to tell me, do I drop them? Do I keep them? <laughs> no, Adam, I'll, I'll give you my husband's cell phone number. Ask him. All right. He's the big fantasy football That's all guy. I wanted tonight was just digits, to be honest. That's all I was looking for. Claudia, <laughs> this, uh, this conversation started about a little bit of history. We went into retention. We talked a lot about the industry, industry and best practices. You were, you were worried uh, that you may not be able to deliver the value that people are looking for. I think this was a fantastic interview. I think you delivered uh, – great information all across the board. I think anybody who listens to this is going to be able to take real actionable steps uh, if they were taking notes and paying attention and listening to somebody who's been there, who's done that uh, with great success and longevity. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you've done in our industry, everything that you've given us uh, and for taking the time. I know you have other things going on right now and this was something you squeezed in. I'm so, Adam, I think, can, can echo the same. We are so appreciative that you took the time tonight um, in closing. Uh, is there any last words, anything that you want to say to, that would encourage other people uh, listening to this or maybe 
who, who, who's just starting out on their run and, and looking to be where you're at in the next 40 years? Oh, I, I can just, all I wanted to do is say thank you for um, inviting me to, to participate tonight. Um, and, and thank you to everyone who shares so generously with IAOA. And I hope that I will see everybody in Phoenix. Yes. And with that note, we're going to end the call. You guys have a fantastic night. On behalf of myself, Adam. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Claudia. We're going to end this. You so much. You guys have a great day. Good night. Good night.